Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you so much to WITS for having me. As Marco mentioned, I'm a journalist and I've been reporting on AI for five years now. And I have profiled people creating the technology, people fighting to change the technology. I've also traveled around the world to profile people affected by the technology. So I wanted to share with you one of the most recent stories I did about a group of workers in Kenya who found themselves doing work for a company that they didn't know and for a product that they didn't understand and how that ultimately left them with anxiety and depression still more than a year later. And I share this story because when we talk about building beneficial AI for everyone, as OpenAI often likes to say, it's really the experiences of the people at the margins that give us the most accurate measure of whether or not we're achieving, achieving that goal. So first, why were there people working on OpenAI's products in Kenya? Um, this is a phenomenon that's much bigger than ChatGPT and much bigger than the AI industry. All digital technologies, internet technologies, have always needed what Mary Gray and Siddharth Suri, two Microsoft researchers, call ghost work. Um, and they define ghost work as the human labor powering many mobile phone apps, websites, AI systems that can be hard to see and is often, in fact, intentionally hidden. And one of the ways that it's hidden is it's outsourced to lower income countries. Um, and ghost work, it, the demand for this has really exploded with the AI industry because of the need for data annotation. All the data that goes into training AI models needs to be cleaned, it needs to be processed, and that work has to ultimately be done by humans. And globally, that work ends up being concentrated in countries that essentially share a few characteristics. They have high education levels, good internet infrastructure, but high unemployment rates. And Kenya checks off a lot of all of these boxes. Um, it also, on top of that, has an English speaking population because of its history of British colonization. And this becomes important because it, it is now a major hub for data annotation for language AI technologies. So in 2021, when OpenAI began looking for their data annotation partner, it was sort of natural that it ended up finding its way to Kenya through its outsourcing firm called Sama. So OpenAI specifically went looking for workers to build its content moderation endpoint. And on its website, it actually has a pretty detailed breakdown of what this endpoint does. So specifically, it is used to check whether content complies with OpenAI's usage policies. And then once the content is identified, developers can decide whether they want to take an action against it, such as filtering it. So essentially, it is a safety filter that is attached onto models. And OpenAI itself uses it for ChatGPT, GPT-4, but it provides it as a service for other generative AI developers as well to check the systems, uh, the final to be the final check on their generative AI systems um, to see whether or not an output should be presented to the user. And on this site, OpenAI also details exactly the categories that um, it looks for, things like hate speech, self-harm, um, sexual content, including sexual content with minors, or extremely graphic violence. And this list is precisely the kind of content that OpenAI ultimately asked workers in Kenya to review. So the workers in Kenya were being given detailed text passages, sometimes up to five or six paragraphs long, that were talking about things like sex with minors or extremely graphic violence. And they had to read all of these passages, assign them a severity level, and then deliver that back to OpenAI. And for this work, they were ultimately paid between a dollar around $1.50 and $3.75 an hour. So how did this affect the workers? Um, the first story that actually broke this was in Time Magazine in January, um, where it talked about how OpenAI had outsourced this labor to Kenyan workers and how it left them with a lot of PTSD. So I ended up going to Kenya in May to meet them, to hear their stories. Um, and I wanted to just play for you um, in their own words, uh, in his own words, Alex Cairo's experience, who is 28 year old worker on the violence content team. When you would go home at night, like what, what would you think about after eight hours of reading all of that, that stuff? Oh, my mental state was, was very bad. I had nightmares. I had, uh, I feared people. Maybe I, I see too many people coming. I see violence. 
if I see someone holding up fork or a uh, razor blade, I see people cutting himself or something like that. At night, I will dream, I will have nightmares. Even I, I will tell my brother, okay, just come here, sit with me like for five hours before I go to sleep because I need someone to talk to before I go to sleep because if I go to sleep, I'll start screaming or something like that. So many things are uh, going a lot in my mind, yeah. yeah. I also met another worker, Mofat Okinye, who was on the sexual content team. And Mofat told me that he read things like parents raping their children, children having sex with animals, with each other. Um, and Mofat also made clear on top of all of the things that Alex experienced that this work didn't just affect him as an individual. It also can affect a community. And in his case, it affected his family because he was on the sexual content team and he was spending so much time reading this stuff, he became very emotionally distant from his wife and his stepchild. He was, he, every time he saw his stepchild, he thought about these passages that he read and he started having really um, anxious, socially anxious behaviors. And the, his personality changed so much that ultimately his wife ended up leaving him and taking um, her daughter with her. Um, and so the other thing that um, when I was in Kenya that I went to do, I visited other workers that also are part of the data annotation industry, but didn't necessarily work on the OpenAI project. And what I um, learned and kind of based off of other reporting that I've done in this area as well is for OpenAI's workers, um, they were already dealing with like an extreme, they were dealing with extremely traumatic content and that in and of itself was harmful to them. But other parts of the data annotation industry that don't deal with that, it, it's it, the content does not necessarily have to be traumatic for the workers to also experience a lot of really difficult challenges and a, a level of essentially labor exploitation in participating in this industry. Um, this is a photo of uh, a neighborhood that I visited to go see a worker that was part of the data annotation industry that didn't work for OpenAI. Um, and this is a photo of, of her with her family. So this is Winnie um, in the fedora hat with her partner, Millicent, and their three kids. Um, and what Winnie described to me was these, these jobs, they're not nine to five jobs. They're not stable jobs. She spent her days tethered to a computer waiting for work to come because she never knew when it would arrive. And when it did arrive, she would work for 22 hours straight, not sleeping because she was that if she went to bed, the work would disappear. She would lose out on the opportunity. Um, but then when the work didn't arrive, it could wait, it could, it could take months for new work to come but because she didn't know when it was coming she would wake up every day sit next to her computer and just sit there and wait for um for the the work to come so ultimately even though she was getting a job she was getting paid um and getting economic opportunity that she might not have access in the end she wasn't actually necessarily net gaining um, in income because there were so many long stretches in which she had no income, but she never uh, she never went to seek other jobs because she was worried about being home and waiting for these these economic opportunities to arrive. So I guess the good news is that there is actually, in fact, a huge opportunity here. Like the, the, the way that these jobs are being implemented right now are not good jobs. They are not well-paid jobs. They're not stable jobs, but they could be. And there's no reason why they shouldn't be. Um, and there's an organization called Fair Work that's run by the Oxford Internet Institute that studies lots of gig work across many industries and has a set of principles that basically organizations could follow to provide actual meaningful work and, in fact, careers around this kind of work. Um, some of the things that they say are we should let workers know who, what work they're actually even doing and who their clients are, like the, the workers in working for Samma didn't even know that they were working for OpenAI. Um, they should also be able to have a manager. Like Winnie didn't even have a manager to contest working conditions with. She didn't even know who she was uh, dealing with day to day. Um, so as the Sama workers told me, they said, treat us like professionals. We have opinions, give us a seat at the table. And not only will that make their working conditions better, it'll also make the technology development better because there will be more diverse opinions in the development of it. 
Um, and remarkably, we are seeing Kenya workers starting to organize demand rights and ask for legislation in this area. But there needs to be international coordination. There needs to be regulation because um, what if Kenya implements rules and other countries don't, data annotation firms can easily move from one to the other. So we really should be taking a cue from the Kenya workers and helping them build more momentum around the movement that they've already sparked within their own country. And if we want to build AI that benefits everyone, we should ultimately start with the development of the technology.